Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Marine Depot. What's happening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Rapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelhammer, and boy, do we have a special show in store for you. We have, um, geez, this is, uh, somebody made the comment here. We've got uh, RB with RB with RB is Reef Bum with Reef Beef and Reef Bright. What's happening, fellas? What's going on, Keith? How you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. So, um... Yeah, this is like wrapping with reef bum meets reef beef with a uh, with a splash of Tulio. And uh yep. and let, let me tell you I have uh, really no idea as long as I can be on top. It's a well, it's, well geez, we're a, getting off to a bad start already there, Tulio, with that comment. <laughs> you're the mole. <laughs> um I just I wanna I wanna ask the folks that are watching here. This is the first time I've actually had three I got three fingers up, three guests. So if um if you're having trouble hearing one of us Please let us know in the uh, in the comments. But um, before we um, we get into this, uh, we're calling it a a panel, I guess, right? This is a panel to talk about lighting. And and I guess what originally I had Tulio scheduled as a guest, but one of the Reef Beef guys had a beef with Tulio, so Tulio invited him onto the show, and um, <laughs> I was I was happy to oblige. Of course, I had to scramble because this happened yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I'm really psyched, and I'm psyched to see all the uh, the folks tuning in. Thanks, thanks, folks, for tuning in. But let me just do a little quick intro here, and then we can kind of like kick things off a little bit. But um, so Tulio, Tulio's been on the show before, and Tulio is from uh, Reef Bright. He's he's I like to say he's a lighting guru. I think you've been called a lighting guru by a, by a lot of folks. Um, I've been called worse. You've been called worse. <laughs> he is an expert, and uh, he's he's spoken at many industry trade shows about lighting. So I'm um, very, very psyched to have Tulio back on the show. Rich Ross, Rich, you were on the show um, three months ago or something like that, and uh, we had a great discussion. Rich has uh, worked in the aquarium industry for many, many years. He uh, was a MASNA Aquarist of the Year, has spoken at, at many industry conferences, including MACNA, written articles about the hobby, and has done some groundbreaking research. In fact, he is uh, sitting in his coral lab and uh, with the tanks right behind him there. So, Rich, uh, welcome back to the show. Ben Johnson. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. Ben Johnson. 
co-host of Hello. What's Happened, Ben? Ben Ben is an aquarium. He's just some guy. He's just some ben just, he's just some anything. random guy that showed up to this live stream. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just a fucking on the ground. He's uh he's another guru. He's a he's an aquarium maintenance guru. So we've got two gurus on the panel, and um, psyched about that. But he's he's taking care of um, reef aquariums for many types of clients, including uh, high end tanks and low end tanks. the uh, The name of his company company is Captive. Aquatic ecosystems, not Captain, right? I, I yeah. saw your first uh, your your first Reef Beef uh, podcast, and people, when you say it fast, um, confuse Captive for Captain sometimes. And um, yeah. Wait, let me correct you on one thing. I don't do any low end tanks. No low end. I just do, and but then I also do extra yes. extra low end tanks, which is just <laughs> a puddle of water with a fish thrown in them. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Uh, so, um, so the company is based in Houston, Texas, and Ben has also spoken at, at Magna, and has uh, strong opinions and attitude about how things should be done with a reef tank. I guess we're going to hear about that tonight, right? And uh, and according and according to Rich, he has great hair. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ben. I if I could have hair like Ben's, I would look like Ben. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There can only be one. So, um, so, so, so both uh, go ahead, Rich. No, I was just going to say something stupid about the quickening. There's, <laughs> there's, there's no reason to have circled back to that, but we did anyway. <laughs> so, uh, both Ben and, and I, I referred to, uh, reef beef have started the uh, reef beef podcast on YouTube earlier this year, and you should definitely check them out. They're very informative, but also very entertaining. And uh, they have frank and off the cuff discussions about the reef keeping hobby. And uh, I'm a big fan of you guys, so uh, I will continue watching. But check them out on YouTube, Reef Beef. So before we uh, we jump in, I just have to do a little uh, business here and thank our show sponsor, Marine Depot. I really appreciate me uh, Marine Depot being the support of the show. And I also um, really want to thank the folks that have been tuning in, the folks that are tuning in right now for watching and supporting the show as well. So please spread the word. Hit that like button because the more uh, likes we get on this live stream, the more people will find it. So uh, go ahead and do that if um, you haven't already. So and and um, I see there's a lot of uh, folks in the chat. We encourage you to ask questions. So this will be a discussion. We've got um, these great guests on, but I will do my best to keep track of all the uh, the questions in the chat. I see ACI Aquaculture is in the house. What's up, Keith Tulio and Reef Beef? Um, Reef and Dive, Trucker Tammy, Coral Vids. Tammy! Tammy's the bomb. Tammy's the bomb, okay. So, um, guys, I think what we talked about in, in terms of uh, kicking off the show is we would uh, start by giving the floor to Tulio, who would, who would, who would begin by kind of giving us a, a lighting 101, a little lighting 101 um, presentation or discussion, however you want to call it, and we'll use that as kind of like a jumping off point we really want to kind of get into all aspects of uh, what's going on in the hobby in terms of lighting. There's a lot of things to talk about. There's a lot of new products out there. There's a lot of old products out there. There's metal halides out there that I've been using for years and years. And, and uh, Reef Bright, you know, has uh, metal halide lighting, but they also have LEDs. So, um, Paula Pal, thank you very much for that super chat. RB times three. Yeah. Thumbs up. It's a fist bump. So, uh, Tulio, why don't you, uh, why don't you lead this off? All right. First of all, Keith, thank you very much for having me. Uh, Rich, Ben, seriously, guys, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, when we when, when when you asked me to come back on the show and do a lighting q and A, it, it, it gave me a thought because I've already done two lighting talks this week and I almost get tired of hearing myself talk. But the reason why I figured Ben and Rich would be excellent candidates to break chops, I mean, to have on the uh, to have on the panel is they've been there in fact ben both ben and rich have seen you know me me from the very beginning you know and i and 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 i'm not saying that's a good thing so please uh you know but but the other thing is is that both ben and rich are, are straight shooters and oftentimes when i say things it's like i don't want people to just take my word for it you know so so the thing is is that if anybody's gonna 
uh, uh, call BS. It'll be Ben or Rich, and, uh, and, and that's why they make excellent panelists for the show. So it's not just me, you know, gurgitating or whatever you want to call it. Um, this is a knockdown, drag them out. We can, we can talk about whatever you want regarding lighting. Yeah, and you guys, just well, don't, drop, uh, don't drop too many F-bombs, you know. Just keep it, uh, keep it sort of in check. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll be good. <laughs> <That's fine>. promise. <laughs> but no, I just figured it'd be entertaining. And, 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 and uh, uh, none of us, you know, for the audience watching, none of us literally have any idea where this is going. We have no idea the questions that Keith has for us. Wrong, wrong, wrong. On my, in my spare time, I'm a psychic. I already know all what's going to happen. And Richard is going to end up choking on that bar of soap. <laughs> I thought that's cream cheese. My Probably. mouth is my mouth is now clean. <laughs> it's clouds. He's eating clouds. <laughs> but yeah, so so Keith, I mean, if it's okay with you, you said you had a bunch of questions lined up. Oh. I mean, we can kind of because I I'm, I'm pretty certain that the questions will lead, you know, will take us in okay. all different directions. And, and I'm prepared. We do have slides and things like that. So we can go over the material collectively. So you're going you're, you're to defer, defer your uh, Lighting 101 presentation. Okay, that's good. That's fine. Yeah, we can kind of like dip in and out of stuff. That's fine. So, um, all right, let's... I mean... Go ahead. Here, here's the thing, Keith. My lighting presentation is very simple. People think of light as something you can see. The bottom line is, is light is invisible to us. We only see it when it interacts with other matter. So what is it? It's energy. So understanding that you start to treat things different. So the talk is focused more on light as energy and the best way to utilize that in various applications for reef and, 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 and other photosynthetic examples. So, all right, Tulio, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, uh, Follow up with that. Just a couple of super chat thank yous to Toast 707. Tulio is the John Wayne Gacy of lighting. That's the comment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to steal that one. Thank you. And Man <laughs> Manny Palma, thank you, man. Awesome work, gentlemen. And he says with the, uh, with the super chat. So, uh, all right. Um, let's, let's, let's start by talking about um, how about PAR? What about the importance of PAR? with a, uh, you know, with, with lighting for a reef tank, you know, so <clears throat> I never have owned a PAR meter. I've always used metal halide lighting, but for the first time a couple of months ago, I did rent a PAR meter to put under my metal halide to see what kind of PAR I had coming out. And I used 400 watt, um, 20 K radium bulbs with a uh, supplemental T fives over my 187 gallon tank. <clears throat> and with my new tank, the 225 gallon peninsula tank, I've got uh, six GHL metros over that tank. Those are LEDs. So I really wanted to kind of see what the par was for the LEDs versus the metal halides. And, and um, you know, the new tank, the peninsula tank is only 20 inches tall. So it's not a very deep um, tank. And the other tank is like 100, uh, the 187 gallon tank is like 24 inches tall. Anyway, what I was finding is that the, um, the par numbers in my, um, under my halides we're in the 200 to 300, maybe the 350 range, yet for the LEDs, they were in the 4 to 500 range. And that was just at, um, you know, 100% in terms of the LEDs. So how important is PAR for an SPS dominant tank in terms of getting growth and colors? Let's, uh, let's start there, Tulio. Okay. Um, in terms of PAR, in terms of PAR... The interesting thing is, first of all, the difference in light sources. And what I mean by that is every light source has its own behavior. OK, and we talk about par again as this 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 number. So, for example, uh, I, I, I often use the example to people where if we were outside and it was a nice sunny day and Rich and I were having a conversation, if I broke out a, a magnifying glass and put it on Rich's arm, he's going to start to feel discomfort immediately. The interesting thing is, though, 
Has the energy from the sun changed? No, it's not. We've just squeezed the light. We focused it. And then obviously this is this is the reaction. So oftentimes based on lighting's behavior, the, the energy equivalent just by measuring par alone doesn't give us the big picture. There's a thing called inverse square law where basically if I took a measurement, let's say I, I took any light source, I'm at 12 inches and I measured its output. Then I went to let's say 24 inches and I measured its output. Obviously the output is gonna be less at 24 inches than it's gonna be at 12 inches. So what happened to that light? Did it just disappear? No, light travels millions of light years in space without any problem. So a few feet of water is not a big deal. What happens is based on inverse square law, the energy is still there. It's just now spread out over a wider field. Okay, it's just now spread out over a wider field. And the interesting thing is, is that if you started to take those energy measurements at 24 inches, for example, in quadrants, and then added it back up, you would see very little light loss because again, a few feet of water is nothing for a photon. So, so PAR can be very useful but it's useful as a reference because the one problem with PAR is unless you have a standard to compare it to. And what I mean by this is if you're absolutely certain of the spectral information, then PAR can be a useful tool. But if it's just PAR alone, I can take an HPS lamp that they use for hydroponics and things like that and give you a ridiculous PAR reading. But yet this is absolutely not a light source you would want over your reef aquarium. Hey, Tulio. Yeah. Is it still a thing where a PAR meter is like 20% plus or minus under LEDs? Maybe the blue spectrum of LED? That was a thing back in the day. You know, Ben, it, it's it, it's interesting that you brought that up. So, for example, a lot of people are familiar with Apogee PAR meters, right? Yeah. yeah. What, what many people didn't realize, now, I can't say for certain that that's absolutely still the case today, but basically for many years, that meter was standardized, meaning it was calibrated and, and, and standardized based on a T5 lamp, not the sun. So, so yes, there were that there were correction coefficients when measuring LEDs. They have gotten better, but what I find interesting is the PAR meter, which was basically came out PAR came out in like the early '70s when uh, horticulture was looking for a better means of measuring light energy from the sun because they were using things like foot candles. So they came up with PAR. So if I'm trying to measure energy for the sun for horticulture, awesome. But if I'm using a T5 lamp to calibrate my meter, then obviously that's a different standardized source than the sun. And that's why if you notice with many PAR meters, there's two selections where you can do it based on the sun or you can do it on what they call electric. And, and that electric source or, or artificial source, that's based on T5 lighting. So uh, Paula Powell had a comment. Uh, I find it interesting that the reef industry always refers to the photon flux density as PAR. Not sure why we don't use PPFD. And, and one other couple of quick uh, thank yous to Daniel Nadal uh, for the super chat. It says beef, whatever that is. And Johnny for the super chat says hit that thumbs up button. But um, Tulia, what about that comment from Paula Powell? Well, simply put, simply put, uh, PAR is a lot easier to say than PPFD. If you say photosynthetic photon flux density really fast, like six times, it just becomes a mess. So PAR was just like, you know how we always shorten words? Um, so PAR was just one of those things. You know, it, you know, people talk about PAR all the time. No different than people talk about pH all the time and literally have no idea what pH actually is, what the acronym actually means, and things like that. Hey, Ben. I'm glad you brought that up uh, because it's, it's, PAR is interesting and useful sometimes, but because it's a number that you get, a lot of people tend to just glom onto the number and then go go a chase in numbers, which we all know is, uh, well, I guess we don't all know that, but which a lot <laughs> of us keep saying is, is a bad idea to go chasing numbers. So exactly. PAR, it's really interesting because it can give you a, an idea of the differences in intensity in different areas of your tank, you know? And I, I, I guess the, the, the rule of, you know, the, the general idea is more bright, better. 
right? Um, which is not always true, but is right. kind of sometimes often true. Um, so it's nice to kind of have an idea, but the real question kind of becomes, what are you going to do about it and why? And, you know, when I switch lights, when I change fixtures, I like to do a quick par check um, to see what's going on so I can either match or come in under the intensity and bring it up. Um, but other than that, you know, almost all the lights that are available now are going to give you enough irradiation, enough light to be able to grow whatever it is you want to grow almost at every depth, you know, unless you're going crazy. If you're, you know, more than 24 inches deep, you, you might want to do something extra. But but the stuff's really good now. It's not like, you know, 2002 when when it all we had was halides or Vita twist bulbs and we were just hoping. Um, sure. So I, I get a little I'm, I'm happy that the information is there. And uh, I'm also a little bummed that the information is there because there's a lot to tease out of it to be able to really know what you're getting at. So I like to just tell people, you know, it's just a relative number that you can use to see if you have more or less light in an area. And Keith, if I can, if I can jump back in. By the way, Rich, very well put. And, and the reason why I say this is because people say par and they latch on to that number. But if you think about this, if you think about this, since, since blue has become a big trend, for example, for many for, yeah. for many aquariums, okay? And Rich, you've done your share of diving, right? So yep. here's the interesting thing. Uh, and, and, and Rich, I'll ask this question for, to you. To get that blue palette that I see in my aquarium, right? Or, or like I'm one of these Grateful Dead tanks and I got the blue tank and, and the whole thing. My hey. point is, Rich, how deep would you have to dive till it gets just blue like that? Very oh, deep. like, yeah, 150 feet, 200 feet, maybe even more. Exactly. And, 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 and so the other thing that I try to explain to aquarists is, what are your goals? Because again, uh, 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 Rich, I, I'm pretty sure you know Dr. Charlie Mazel, right? Uh, He's the fluorescence guy, Night Sea and all oh, of that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, Charlie and I go way back. So now what we're dealing with is we're dealing with a tank where we're eliciting fluorescence. And that is a process unto itself where a photon enters at one wavelength and leaves at another wavelength. And what the other thing that becomes very interesting, speaking about blue light, is that the shorter the wavelength of light, the shorter the wavelength of light, and this, this is what Rich was saying about too much is not always a good thing, but the shorter the wavelength of light, the higher the energy level of the photon. So the point is, is you're pumping these systems with all of this light, and unless other conditions are there for them to be able to utilize this energy, that can actually be detrimental. For example, like a house, you know, like a plant, a house plant. Well, it relies not only on photosynthesis, but there's the nutrients in the soil, the water, specific pH. There's all these other things that have to be in place in order for that, because you can have the best lighting system in the world for your plant, but if it doesn't have the nutrients, if it doesn't have the proper pH conditions and all these other conditions in place, so it can process and utilize that energy, you're going to have an unhealthy plant. Limiting, limiting factors. Yeah. Yeah. So, so people often say, oh, it's the light, it's the light, it's the light. And, and like Rich basically said, lighting has gotten so much better over the years. I mean, I remember back in the days, the lighting systems we had, let's say, 25, 30 years ago, they were just literally dangerous. You might as well just take a cord from your wall and stick it in the tank, because that's basically what we were working with, with some of the halides and some of the other systems like that. Well, lighting has improved to the point where... Pretty much as long as you're sticking to what I would say known or reputable manufacturers, all of these lights can give you excellent results if used properly. What's, a, what, what, what's I, the general I, consensus in terms of the, uh, the panelists' uh, opinions in terms of the, uh, the, the, uh, the advent of the blue light in terms of the tanks and the, the, um, just the fluorescence that you see with those blue lights? It just seems like that's a lot of folks are fixated on that. I have to say that in my job, where it's kind of like where the rubber meets the road, so I, you know, maintain tanks, install them. Sometimes I pick up clients that already have kind of like a train wreck of a tank, and I rehab that back. 
And, and Julio was saying, you know, that there's a lot of great stuff out there. I have to throw in a caveat that I see a lot of trash. <laughs> I see a lot of crap. I'm trying to be I'm trying to be polite. I'm trying to be He's polite to be professional. Yes, there is a lot of trash out there too. Well, let's, trash let's, is trash yeah. is Ben's bread and butter. If uh, yeah. you know, it wasn't for trash, you'd be poor. <laughs> But uh, what, so what does everybody think in terms of the advent of the uh, the blue lighting uh, wave here that we've uh, seen with reef tanks? I mean, I, I, I personally am not a big fan of um, very blue, uh, you know, a lot of blue light in, in my reef tanks. I'm kind of getting used to it in terms of the LEDs. But um, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, but, you know, when you fly in the face of what are, whatever popular opinion is, you kind of look like an old dude in black socks waving your fist out. <laughs> So, you know, oh, blue tanks are stupid. That's cool, Grandpa. Go put your teeth back. Yeah. I mean, that's what's great about the hobby. There's just different segments. If you yeah. want to, if you want to Ajax tank with unnatural look, I'm not even making fun of it. Just go for it. My preference, me personally, like I look at tanks like Julian Sprung sets up, and I love that kind of thing. It's extremely natural look. I'll tell you what I love about LEDs now that they're good is I can have the tank look different ways whenever I want it to. So I've got my new lights set up um, on a controller. So I've got, I can hit a switch and they go to 12K. I can, whatever 12K is, you know, this is all relative. It's not actually 12K. It's what we are calling 12K. Or I've got one that's, what Benjamin? Stop chasing numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I've, okay, this one's better. I've got one that's called Disco. So it yeah. can be all blue, but I think I need to change it to Grateful Dead now because I think that's a better <laughs> so way to this say is it. A... You know, I've got the I've got the one that's a Phoenix 14K. I've got 7K, so I can I can look at it under different lights. And and as the day goes in my tanks, the spectrum changes over the course of the day. So at different times of day it looks differently. So I'm kind of hitting all the things that I think the corals might need based out of my butt. Who knows if there's really a difference between doing that or not. Um, but th that's what I think. I, I think the blue is fine. If people like blue, they should have blue as long as it's not hurting the animals. People like, uh, you know, 2K lights. They should have 2K lights. So I think the LEDs are great because you could do whatever you so want. So th this is that's interesting that you said that, Rich, because uh, Ben Cook make, is, is asking uh, – this question to uh, to Tulio would love to hear Tulio's thoughts on changing the spectrum throughout the day in terms of how that impacts the uh, the health of the corals. Do you see anything negative in terms of switching up the spectrum like that, Tulio? Yes, I do, and 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 here's why: because they have no way of monitoring the spectrum. They're adjusting the channel without really knowing what that impact might be. For example, the sun, um, you know, its spectrum, even, even as it moves, it, its spectrum is relatively, is relatively constant until it gets to the far end. I, I did like, I don't know if you could see this, I did like my little sunset, sunrise kind of thing. Well, when the sun is on the horizon, for example, most of that light is being reflected off the surface. So very little, if any, light is actually reaching the core. Worlds. I see people sometimes with like 16 hour photo periods and I'm like, listen, in the wild, uh, you know, corals may only receive maybe about 10 hours of, of actual light because when the sun is rising, they're not getting much. When the sun is setting, they're not getting much. It's only when the sun is at a certain angle that they're getting any appreciable amount of light. And then interestingly enough, it's only a very short period that the light is directly over them. So again, even though the sun is moving now to experiment, I'm not saying that experimentation is bad because I'm all for that. And could there be some benefit to it? There absolutely could. But the problem is, is because, it, for example, if you don't have a spectrometer or a means to really measure or, or, or really gauge what you're doing, when you set your UV to 50% and you set your blue to 75%, that's just based on the setting on the light fixture. Yeah. But if you look at the light mixing from an optical standpoint, which only a spectrometer can truly tell you, you're, you're kind of... Uh, 
shooting in the dark, really, because when you look at the optical systems, and I can use the Coral Care, or I can even use the Sky, for example, their optical systems are completely different than other LED systems, which means that the light is mixed differently, and that also plays a role. Yeah, and it's, it's you know, I, I don't think you should willing, you know, I don't change it randomly except for viewing, you know, it's set up on a virtual outlet, so it stays for 10 minutes and then it automatically switches back. You know, I've got the spectrum shift that I use, which is mostly for my viewing pleasure. Um, and then that stays because your corals are going to adapt to whatever you got going on. Exactly. If you're shifting it around all the time, you're going to have problems. I mean, or you will likely, you're more likely to have problems than not. You know, I, I used to say the thing I hate the most besides testing in reef keeping is when it's time to change your lights. Um, I, I hate that. I hate that couple of months after you change your lights because you're 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 pissing off the major input into your animals. Well, um, experimentation yeah. in reef tanks, not just lighting, but everything, is so kind of problematic because. You know, first of all, if you don't know what you're doing, like, oh, do this or oh, do that. You know, let's do lights, do this, do that. I mean, th any sort of experimentation needs to be borne out over the course of several months. You can't just do it for like a week or two and say, oh, that didn't work. Yeah. Just not long enough for it to, you know, meanwhile, the corals are changing up their physiology, switch to whatever the hell you're doing. And, and it's funny because while we're on this, and Rich, I'll use you in his, as an example because you've had to monitor so many different systems at once, for example. Uh, I, see go, I see guys going online and saying, hey, Joe, what's your light setting? Because I want to put that in my light, you know, I want to put that on my light setting. Well, guess what? Your tank is different than Joe's tank. And based on alkalinity and so many other factors, again, being able to utilize that energy, whether good or bad, you know, just picking these light spectrums out of the blue and saying, hey, I'm going to try Joe's, you know, watch the corals, watch the out consumption, you know, watch the out consumption, watch the corals, because oftentimes the corals will tell you, and Rich is correct, when you make these changes, it can take weeks or even months for you to really either see any progress or, or, or otherwise. I had a, um, one of these tanks back here, or two, three of these tanks back here, um, they're uh, Radeon 4 Pros, and two of the channels were not working for, for a reason we don't care about, uh, for probably about three months. And I noticed problems developing, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I'm not going to say that was the problem, but it certainly feels like that's the problem. The, 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 the animals were just not reacting the way they should be. They weren't looking, some were losing tissue. They just were not doing right. And I found that uh, those channels were off and I got to reset everything and bring them back on. And within a few days, it seems like uh, things are recovering and getting back to it. I, and what brought that up was the idea of, you know, your months or your, your weeks or months of, of looking into what's changed, right? So it took me a couple of months to dig that deep into what's going on in the tank to figure that out. Um, although I do find it interesting that it feels like, and you know, I could be just happy that I found something that I can hang the problem on. Um, but you know, you know, some of those things sure look like they're coloring up like they're supposed to be uh, instead of what they had become. So yeah, it takes a long time and, and you know, stability is the key, right? Slow changes over time. If you know, if you like the blue lights, your stuff's gonna adapt to the blue lights. If you like the, you know, the the less blue, stuff's gonna look less blue. And you know, you know, my tanks are goofy with phosphate and nitrate, so you know, I'm always on the edge of what's wrong anyway. I'm always making sure things are going okay. But yeah, I just uh, ended up um, my train in my head that was going down the track to a point um, stopped rolling. So someone else should talk now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ben, I got a question for you. So, you know, you've got a lot of clients that you uh, take care of in terms of their tanks. And uh, obviously lighting is a big decision, you know, and, and, and a, a pricey decision in terms of, um, you know, equipment that goes onto a tank. What, what do you advise your, uh, your clients in terms of, you know, is it LEDs? Is it T5s? I mean, is it a combination of uh, T5s and halides? You know, what, what's your uh, perspective on the best 
you know, source of light. Let's let's say for uh, S SPS dominant reefs, and um, you know why. Luckily for me, I don't tend to deal with hobbyists. Um, I do have ah. clientele <laughs> that are, you know what I mean? No, no, exactly. no, I mean, I'm a hobbyist, too, <laughs> and screw me. But, you know, like, usually what I run into are, um, and no offense meant here, but I'm just saying, um, okay, less experienced hobbyists who, who, um, who realize that they got in over their head and then they bring me in to kind of fix stuff up. Right. But I would say my ideal um, clientele that I get is just a wealthy individual that just wants a piece of living art. That's nice because I don't have to argue with anyone over blah, 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 this and that, which is fine. I have discussions and arguments with some clients that want to be involved. But, um, well, I guess, too, on the side, I also do consultations. So that's where that would come more into play, where people are bouncing stuff off my head. And that has you know, ideal lighting. That has a lot to do with how tall the tank is a lot of people it's it's funny because earlier y'all said like oh if you go real crazy you do 24 inches well you get a lot of people that uh, have tanks way deeper than 24 inches um and and i think that's so cool keith that you do uh um still do halides because i still think there's a place for them um and if you get a really deep tank that could be great um you could also spend 10 times as much and pack it up with some high-end leds but that works great as well um shallower tanks i still like t5s i like uh, i uh, uh, tulio is going to squirm in a seat but i use reef bright a lot for for especially yeah. on shallower tanks that um, stuff sucks why do you run yeah. that ben yeah no i have i have one popular tank that got bombed out in that recent uh ice storm that happened here in texas but this uh this uh it's 10 foot long by one foot tall by one foot deep wow. tank that's kind of artistic looking it's in the back of a lady's uh movie theater room and it was a formerly like fantastic tank it just like it just bombed out during that storm but it's got a reef bright with the blue LEDs down the side, and then it's got T5s on either side. I use ATI daylight bulbs for that. And that works. I mean, that kept uh, Tridacna clams in there for like five years. It, it grew, you know, even some SPS in there. It grew like crazy. But, you know, then you get a little deeper than that, and you're just going to have to use something with more punch. You know, I've, I'm pretty sold these days with, with strong higher-end LED and... I remember back in, I remember in the 90s, like one of the biggest choices, money choices you were going to make for your reef tank was freaking live rock. Do y'all remember yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. Like the expensive choice you're going to, you know, nowadays, I'd have to say it's probably lighting, you know. There's, see, Ben, I, I, I want to point out that Ben does like hobbyists. Uh, <laughs> he just doesn't like to argue reefs with hobbyists. Because, no, I don't mind. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to put words in your mouth. I don't I don't like it if your opinion is stupid. There we go. <laughs> Just jump right off the cliff. There you go. Yeah. I still have my metal halides. I, I got rid of them. I stopped using them seven, eight years ago now, I think. Um, and they're under the house. The ballasts are still installed behind the tank, the display. Jan Wayne Gacy. And... Um, um, <laughs> They're still down there, and I was I was going to get rid of them when I was doing some cleaning up a few months ago, and I just can't bring myself to get rid of my custom Luminarc fixtures with two sockets in each. You know, they were just so great for so I'm, long. I got a couple of those on my frag tank. They're plus, great. Plus a couple and of Reef Bright uh, Halide Hybrid uh, fixtures. What I really, what what really kind of drove me away from Halides was the idea that the uh, of not having to change the bulbs so often um environmental impact kind of thing like that and i have no idea which is which is worse to change your led fixture every four or five years or change your metal halide bulbs once a year um i i have no clue but uh i also wanted to support leds because it was clear that the industry was going that direction so um, there's another question from Ben Cook, and I was going to get into this in terms of the spectrum, but uh, would you say it is um, best to just set one spectrum on LEDs and just ramp up and down with intensity? 
you know, no all blue morning and night type of thing. What do you guys think about that? I'll 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 start this off. I'll start this off. If 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 you think historically about the lighting we've all successfully used in the past, whether it be halide or T5, you selected a certain lamp, its spectrum was basically fixed, and you were either good to go or not. And 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 we adjusted via photo period because back then we didn't have all the ramping up and down kind of thing. And 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 uh, I guess what I'm getting at is. Any good light source, any any light source that's properly designed should basically be able to like, if you set your settings, let's say all equally, right? You should be able to have success and results where now you're controlling the intensity. You know, back in the day, we, we, we designed light sources so that it was everything we thought you needed over your tank. Right. You know? and, 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 and so there, you know, Rich, I seen you kind of, you know, tightened up a little bit on there so if you want to interject awesome but 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 yeah yeah i was just gonna say i i always since i started keeping modern reefs uh actually now that i think about it forever i've always used multiple bulbs over my my coral tanks so you know even when i ran the halides i always had a fluorescent bulb until you know and the first leds i got were you know blue leds to replace the you know whatever the t12 you know actinic light i was using uh to supplement the idea of the supplemental lights so i've i've always run them with the bluer lights that would come on earlier in the morning and then the halides would come on in the afternoon and then reverse at the end of the night as well um and the other thing is it's always seemed to me like i got better growth and health when i had more blue on the tank rather than just like a you know a daylight halide um and that could be completely made up as well that could just be me feeling that that was the case um but that's what i felt was the case whenever you know and sometimes when things were going bad uh after the switch to um xhos um some reef bright company or something i you get those from <laughs> um you know I realized once when those were like old, they were four or five years old and I switched them out to new ones and things got better. So uh, I like I like the mix, but I, I like the feel of how a tank changes over over the day. But I, you know, I think you're right. It can be you can slap the one light on and change the intensity and be done and stop dicking around with all of these variables you do not need to mess with any of these variables they're they're only for for nuts like most hobbyists <laughs> I, I wonder how many of the people watching remember back in the mid mid I, I guess i'd say mid 90s back when it was uh uri vhl bulbs with the uh, with the acrylic guillotine thing and the ice cap 660 mm. ballast and all that but you can't if you had been around those Man, those those would produce very darkly colored corals, very healthy corals. But you had to replace the bulbs like once every six months, and there was the old T yeah. twelve bulbs. But you couldn't deny. You see, like uh, a lot of times, it was soft corals and LPS back then. But um, they, those did produce some good corals. But I think the you know the bulbs would fall off in intensity and spectrum real fast, and so it was kind of too wrong. I'm I really missed the end caps catching on fire. Yeah. <laughs> when they weren't totally on and they arc a little bit. You know, you come home that one day and you go, what is, what is that? <laughs> yeah. You go sniffing around your tank. Well, you know, and, and it's funny that Ben brought up the VHOs for two reasons. One, uh, for example, back, back in the days with the ice cap fallacy, they were basically overdriving these lamps. And the reason right. for the shortened lamp life and every and, and, and this is one of those ironic things where, like Rich said earlier, more is not necessarily better. So when it comes to lamps, T5s included, they have an ideal operating temperature. So, for example, a T5 lamp, that's about 35 C. Once you go over that, you, you get an effect called droop where you're starting to produce more heat than light. So you use, you're losing light output, actually. 
and you're causing premature degradation of the lamp. Hence why we used to use fans back in the day. And, and so the cooler you can run your lamps, you will get better life out of them and things like this. So ironically enough, back in the day with the VHOs, yeah, they, they, they were like crazy over driving them and hence the burnt up lamp sockets and hence, hence the replacing the lamps every six months. Which is probably ice cap was in cahoots with uri and they're like how can we sell more of these bulbs and like drive the hell out of them <laughs> oh yeah well and ironically enough i used to manufacture and design a lot of stuff for ice cap back in the day which is why i'm so familiar uh, it was you it was you <laughs> ironically <laughs> ironically <laughs> laser <laughs> it was all my fault so um I want to talk more about metal halides because, um, you know, that's that's a lighting source that I've been using my whole reef keeping career. And, you know, I, I have um, gone to the uh, to the dark side a little bit and, and switched to uh, to LEDs for the new tank. But, uh, you know, I, I want to uh, I want to try that out. But let's let's talk about metal halides and, and compare those to the LEDs and the T5s in terms of, you know, coverage, par, spectrum. You know, if if um, all things were equal, and we didn't have to worry about um, you know the heat coming out of the and and Reef Bright, you know, will solve that issue in terms of the heat and the metal halide fixtures, which is which is awesome. But um, you know, the the bulbs can can emit some heat um, on top of the tank. But um, if if you guys had to, uh, and I guess I'm gonna have to exclude Tulio. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this question to the Reef Beef guys. You know, if um if you had to pick one bulb or one source of light to um, grow SPS, color them up, what would that be? Would it be T5s? Would it be T5s, metal halides? Or would it just be LEDs? Or would it be LEDs, T5s? Everything else being equal? Yeah. If you didn't have to worry about what? cost, if you didn't have to worry about, you know, heat, um, you know, you just want the best light source to grow corals um, really well and to color them up really really well and not have to worry about um you know replacement costs you go first ben okay so all joking aside i mean this very seriously in that uh, tulio and i have known each other for a long time so what happens first is i call tulio <laughs> <laughs> And I ask him, no, no, I, I talk to Tulio all the time. I ask him lighting questions because here's what Ben knows about lighting. <laughs> and where you can't see my other hand over here, that's what Tulio knows about lighting. So, I, to, you know, to be quite frank with you, it's not that I'm so concerned about, oh, do I do T5s and LEDs and halides? And do I bring back power compacts and PLs? And do I put a candle <laughs> up there? It, good, strong lighting of some way, shape or form above your tank and create stability and learn what the hell you're doing. And that colors corals, not about which freaking light that you picked. I would go with uh, 250 watt Phoenix DE bulbs. You're being so literal, Richard. <laughs> what about the Awasakis? I'm, 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 I'm answering the question that was asked <laughs> instead of the story that's playing in my head movie. <laughs> Who's paying you to say that, Richard? What would you say, Tulio? What about what? Oh, what about the Awasakis? <clears throat> Those are great too. Those were fine. I I I like the blue. So uh and I and I thought I got I mean you know, I'm I'm sure it's rose colored glasses, but I'm thinking back and my favorite is tank, um with the just lush purple digitata. Um, you know was uh it was running uh esv bionic hmm. and um you know and just regular water changes uh with instant ocean and uh it had the, the those bulbs on it um the de bulbs let's face it that was a total money-making scam right because you couldn't yeah. replace those without breaking three of them <laughs> right oh, and uh, those exclusively yeah, and and some other blue, um, some other blue uh, supplementation. I love that. Why did no? Can I, can I jump yeah, in real ahead. quick? No, because because no. Uh, Here we go. No, no, no. Here we go. Um, like 
<laughs> Remember earlier when I mentioned how light sources have different behaviors, right? So I actually did an experiment one time with halides. And basically the experiment was how much light could I pump into these corals yeah. before causing them to, to like, you know, bleach or whatever you want to call it, have a problem. And here's the interesting thing. Uh, Joy was at a trade show, I forget what show it was, and she comes home, and Worldwide Corals had sent her home with a bunch of these corals. And one of them, or one or two of them were SPS. Now, in the old days, like Ben said, you know, if you're dealing with an SPS, the conventional thinking was just pump it with as much light as you possibly can, right? So I took this one SPS, and I put it right top, like right at the top of the reef where you just, I mean, literally this thing was six inches away from the halide fixture. I was measuring par levels of, of upwards of, of a thousand, okay? We're talking ridiculous amounts of light. But here was the interesting thing. Unbeknownst to me, the coral was a deep water echinata, but it didn't fry. Now, here's my question. Ben, because you've worked with a lot of different types of lighting, LED included. If you took a thousand, you know, if you if you reached par levels of a thousand using an LED system, would it be fair to say that you'd bake a few corals? If I can ask the viewers to come in a little closer to the camera, <laughs> a little closer, a right. little closer, a little closer. <laughs> and, and tell your children to go away. I'll give you five seconds for your children to go away. And my message to you is shit does not need to be this complicated. <laughs> Bingo. So, so the point is, is that the light sources behave differently. And, and so, for example, LEDs are great by, by, by their inherent design, the way they produce light. They're great at throwing light down. But, but on the other side, because there's nothing, there's no such thing as perfect, right? So the downside is oftentimes this light can be very focused. Whereas with, with metal halides, yes, it, it's a very incoherent light source. It's just like these photons are bouncing in all different directions. And hence we're using these reflectors to try to kind of redirect some of that energy and get it down in there. It's just, uh, they're different. You know, they are different. It, 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 it's not really a, an apples to apples kind of thing. Corals, corals can adapt to many yeah. different things as long as you give them enough time to do so and as long as they're not so far skewed off of what's recognized as you know lighting chemistry everything you know to where we would all agree that that's terrible they can adapt to that if you just give them time the thousand par like if you as long as you step that up and gave it time it can adapt to that yeah. there's no magic number and let's face it the, the the corals in our tanks are not the same as in the ocean right because you get a thousand par you get, a, you. you get a thousand par easy, you know, on a reef flat. You know, when we were collecting in Palau, it was unbelievable how much light they're getting. But the water also moves across that area twice a day at, you know, uh, 50 centimeters, 50 centimeters a second at least. You know, the entire, that's a, like a water change every second. You know, it's just an immense amount of water flows over that with the glitter lines and the surface agitation and the yada and the yada. So your, your corals are looking to par levels from the ocean isn't really what we're trying to do in our tanks. And, uh, you know, again, it's back to that there's a number. You know, there's a number and people love numbers. And so as soon as they read this is what this coral is getting in the ocean, they want to try to give that to their coral at home. But they're also not keeping a reef flat tank or very few people you know they're using corals from all depths and and they're not going to react the same way in a lot of the cases also earlier tulia was talking about limiting factors you got to remember this is all a big puzzle that goes together coral yeah. coloration you give it a thousand par you better be pumping you know alkalinity and calcium into there otherwise you're just going to piss it off you're giving it the energy to grow but you're not giving it the building blocks to grow so that you know it's interesting now with like alcatronic and trident and stuff like that then you can keep track of that so just giving a sps yeah. a bar that's not going to do crap unless you're bringing the rest of the puzzle to it let's um i know go ahead rich yeah no i was gonna say 
Uh, what else? Because somebody seems to be like, I want that. That's enough lighting in the chat. Somebody wrote, <laughs> yeah. that's enough lighting. <laughs> Go away, no lighting person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, this is a lighting panel we've got going here, so, yeah. you know. But it's it's your show, so we do whatever you say. I shouldn't even look at the, at no. the chat. Cause no. That's like someone that's mad that there's no rap playing at the country <laughs> western band. Right? I'm so angry at that. <laughs> Let's talk about hamster care. Let's ha talk about ham switches. Hamster care. Hamster care. Ham um... I'm just looking at some of the comments. So, um, all right, I'm going to still stick with lighting. And okay, all right, and I still have some questions about lighting. So I'm going to hold your group. Yeah, exactly. So what what uh, what do you guys think in terms of the uh, the evolution of um, you know the next generation of LEDs? It, are the the Neptune sky lights the um, you know the uh, the panel style lights, the Philips Coral Care is is kind of is that kind of like the next uh, generation of LED lights? It seems like what they're trying to do is almost like replicate the coverage that you would get with T fives, with those panel style lights. What what are your thoughts in terms of what's coming out? Um, you know, lately in terms of the uh, the new LEDs that we're seeing. I'm gonna jump on that because I have the skies on my display. Um, and, and I'll tell you why I like them. I, I like the distribution of the light. My tank is kind of packed. And, um, you know, my goal is to get it to be one solid block of coral filled from edge to shining edge. And my rockscape comes very out. So, so it's, it's not easy to get light everywhere in my tank, uh, which is another reason why I like LED supplementation when I, supplementation when I was running. I'm, I'm being Tulio now. When I was running um, uh, halides, I um, I used to do supplementation. So I, you know, I liked when I, I liked on the G4s when Ecotech came out with the diffusers because it kind of spread the light some more. I like the large panel of uh, of the uh, of the skies. I run three of them over my 60-inch tank when two would be just fine uh, because I like to have them spread out towards the edges in the front of the tank more. So I run them a little not as intense as I would if I was running two. Uh, so I, I like that. I, I think what, what maybe, maybe what we'll see, how's that for hedging, <laughs> is, is we'll see what we've seen in pumps, right? When, when the MP40, when the Vortex came out, you know, everyone was all about, we should have prop pumps, prop pumps, and gyre pumps, and, and then, uh, you know, uh, impeller pumps. The, the thing about pumps is they're all for different applications. I, I will use a different water motion device depending on what I want to be happening in, in a certain area of a tank. And perhaps we're going to see the same thing with uh, LEDs. You'll use a puck style when you're doing more of a uh, of a lower reef tank rather than something that climbs up and shadows, and you'll want something more panelly when it's more diffuse. And you know, I think spotlights are really underused uh, as as a as a dramatic lighting feature. But I can understand that at home. What what happens to most home tanks is you end up just trying to grow as much as you can everywhere. But if uh, if you're doing a dramatic tank, man, a single point source from a spotlight is so sexy. Man, in, in my business where I have to, um, you know, people call me up and they say it depends how much knowledge they have, but they say what they want to see. Now, I may temper that if it's kind of an unrealistic request of something that I know to work better. But I mean, so I mean, I get people call me all the time and I end up setting up tanks all the time for the last 25 years. It's, you know, long, skinny, tall, fat, all over the place. Uh, what Richard said about the dramatic like you get a, a, a Kessel, something like that, and put it on a like a freshwater uh, fish only system with manzanita roots, and you put it real dramatically coming in diagonally from the side. And it's crazy cool looking, you know. So it doesn't all have to be about reef. And really, you know, you say, what do you like? LED, hey, like everything has a use. It's like what Richard just said for pumps. I mean, I see so many different tank styles that everything's a it's all tools and everything's in the toolbox and everything could be used for any given situation. We used LED cannons for moonlight, you know, just for effect. And you know, I had them so low and at such a harsh angle to the water surface. 
Um, so it made these great ripples, and it was just really dramatic and nice. And, and I'll also say something. I'm a little bit weird with lights because all of my lights on all my tanks hang. I don't do any tank-mounted anything like that. And, and I think I realized that a lot of people are looking for options that mount to their tanks. So um, if that's important to you, I, I don't have much to say on that topic because I just make sure everything's hanging above my tank because I found that to be easier for the way I like to do a reef. So if, if, if mounting options are important, um, talk. Uh, don't listen to me. <laughs> Tuli, don't listen to me anyway. Look at my what? head. I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> oh, oh, something's falling. Hey, okay, Tulia, no, what? Uh, so, what does the future hold for Reef Bright? You know, obviously, you guys uh, sell metal halide fixtures, and you also have uh, the XHOs. You know, in, in terms of the LEDs, is there going to be a, um, a a true mainstream LED fixture that uh, you guys are going to be developing down the road, or are you going to still kind of um, you know push the hybrid type of uh, fixture? No, no, it's interesting because, uh, uh, and actually, I'd just like to jump back for a minute to the sky and the Philips Coral Care, and, and Rich hit it right on the head where lighting is like a tool, and people will use them like pumps and different applications and things like that. So, for example, uh, not getting into the whole Reef Bright spiel, but when I did the X-Series, I had the opportunity to work with the G5s, the Ecotech G5s. I had the opportunity to work with the 360Xs you know, the Kessels and things like that. And each one of these has what I call a sweet spot for a given tank or a given application. Now, I do like what I'm seeing in terms of the sky and the Coral Care. I mean, the Coral Care is an excellent, it, it really is an excellent platform. I can say that because I've had the fixture apart and I actually come from the Phillips family some 20 years ago. And, and I know that even Terrence, you know, used the Coral Cares for quite some time. So I like that platform. It is an awesome platform, but again, it's not an absolute, you know, you you can still do great with Kessels. You can still do great with your Ecotex. It's not that. But the thing that I do like, and I will say this because both Ben and Rich are here. Ben, you've seen me producing LEDs for what, close to 20 years now from the first moonlights? 2001. On 2001, right. you were at the first iMac with me. I represented a company that we shall not speak about. Okay. <laughs> Eco Aqualizer. Ben <laughs> sold Eco Aqualizer. It was Ben. Wait, that, that's go see watch Reef Beef episode number two and that will explain all that to you. But but it was so cool because that's where I met Tulio and he was at a little booth showing me LEDs. I remember walking to him, I started talking about him. He was like, oh shit, you get it, because we were talking about what they could be and what could become and now they just seem so crazy here we are and they are what can be and what would become but it was just i don't even remember what it was back then tulio do you remember it was just a little dinky light no but that was before pfo got sued exactly exactly so keith can you pull up the image that says moonlight yeah okay you'll see it in about 20 seconds okay oh god I'll well that's here. coming up do you remember the the first LEDs that came out was for Moonlight, but it was also advertised as curing ick? Do you remember <laughs> that? that? No, that no, was no, it wasn't you. But that was like the first ones that were coming out, and and I went, this is a load of dingo's kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> I think I ate my baby. <laughs> there it is, Tulio. All right. Oh, look okay. at that. Oh, I remember Tulio, that. Ben, you remember this? this yeah. Was, this yes. was the old. This was the own moonlight. Now, here, just to have some fun, Keith, there's an image that says iMac 2003. Yep. Throw that one up yep, there. Yeah, that's common. Wow. And, and Ben, you mentioned, you mentioned the whole PFO lawsuit thing yeah. and everything else like that. This aquarium that you're going to see was actually in that lawsuit because it was, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, this tank was even in FAMA. It was the first aquarium completely lit with leds white and blue leds included i set it up in my hotel room at imac and we had a line of people going out the door looking at this snake oil technology that 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 you know but but that was actually the the very first com you know and that was only 13 watts that tank that was only 13 watts that tank but I the reason why i bring this up if you look at the aquarium keith is the aquarium showing yeah, it is. 
Yeah. Okay. If you look at the aquarium, ignore the par numbers. But what's very interesting, do you see that very even spread and panel style approach? Well, knowing, you know, Rich, both you and Ben know my products. I've always attempted to spread light. I've always attempted to project light over the largest area possible. And that's why I like the, the, the coral care and the sky and where some of this stuff is going, because there's absolutely advantages to that approach as well. Yeah. Is that the type of product going to be a potential future product for Reef Bright or you're not, uh, you can't disclose that at this point? You know, um, I'm going take take the fifth. Problem, no, 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 no. Honestly, half my problem is, do we really need another LED fixture? So unless I can do something, unless I can do something that really has an advantage or a benefit, you know what I mean? It's like I I don't know. I'm still kind of on the fence with that. We need the reef bright reef beef LED. <laughs> reef we can make that happen from reef bright reef beef RB three. RB3. RB3. <laughs> UBU, RB3. So um, let's, I, I want to I go back to Metal Halides again, Tulio. So um, what, <laughs> what, 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 hey, why, don't you, why don't you dust off your bell bottoms? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second. I will. <laughs> I, gotta, I, actually, I, gotta, I actually have to dust off my Luminar uh, reflectors. Those things are really uh, yeah. practically falling apart. But, um, you know, so Tulio, for those of us that uh, continue to run those types of uh, fixtures and bulbs, what, what's, what's the future hold in five years? Is it going to be difficult to find metal halide bulbs? No, actually, actually, in fact, uh, for example, I just got an order from the Maori Aquarium for 40,000 watt lamps. There's still a lot of facilities that use them. In fact, Rich, I think Steinhardt still runs halides. Yeah, it's been um, over, over the big reef for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we have had, again, whether good or bad, I can just tell you because we do sell a lot to public aquariums, places like Disney and other people like that, and we have had exhibits where they change the exhibit over to LEDs, and I, again, I'm not saying whether one is better or not, but there was a different response because, see, public aquariums treat their exhibits differently, and they felt compelled enough to reinstall metal halides. Now that that's not for every single application, but they're like I think Shed Aquarium, one of their exhibits with their anemones. Once they put the halides back on there, it you know the anemones seem to to respond better and things like that. It's not an absolute, but there are. Okay, Rich, go ahead. I had that on two exhibits. I went to LED and then I went back within two months. And I was we can't. I was gonna are the, these are tanks specifically that have photosynthetic animals in them, or yeah. was some of them just for aesthetics? One one was for a SPS tank, and the other was for a a Ceph tank that had mostly leathers in it, and um, they just did not do as well. And because it's on display, um, you know, I we I didn't want to leave it for six months to adapt. It was like we changed something. Yeah. Clearly, there was causation here, um, so we flipped it back, and then things got back to where we wanted. Now, Rich, I'd like you to consider something because I've actually talked to uh, uh, Steve Bailey from New England Aquarium, yeah. a few other people about this. So, for example, with a metal halide, because of the way it transmits and produces light, meaning the plasma arc and so on and so forth, it really is kind of the closest thing we have to sunlight. In, in yeah. the way it produces its light. Now, with reef tanks, we talk about corals, but we often forget about the important phototropic organisms that are in the water column themselves. These are planktons and things like this. So now, if we look at LEDs, and, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Keith, I didn't put any images in there, but if I showed you the spectral signature of, of LEDs, first of all, you will always see a heavy blue peak. And the reason for that is because even the white LEDs is nothing more than a blue LED chip 
with a phosphor coating on it. And it takes some of the blue energy emitted from the blue LED chip and converts that via the phosphor, stoke ship, yada, 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 and you get your red and green and you get the white light. But if you were to look at the pattern, you get a heavy blue, there's kind of like a dip, and then you start to come up again with some of the red, you'll have a little bit of green and everything else. Well, interestingly enough, with metal halide, similar to like the sun, you just get this all kind of thing. And here's where it becomes interesting. I was invited to the Milford lab, Noah. You, Rich, I know, you, I'm, I know you guys are familiar. So yeah. I was at a conference, it was an oyster conference of all things. And I was talking to Dr. Nochi, their head planktologist, and he was telling me what he was doing. And I had the unpleasant task of explaining to him how their work wasn't really valid because they really didn't have a standardized source that they were working with because they were using Kelvin and PAR and none of these things that actually quantified the light sources. So he was so intrigued that he invited me to Noah. So as soon as I sat down at the table, now keep in mind, Noah is responsible for, I believe, over like 200 species of these different planktons. They're like a seed bank for the world. And if you, you know, facilities like, you know, Rich and some of these other places, if you want some, they'll send it to you and everything else. So I sit down at the desk and the very first words out of their mouth was, hey, what do you think about this blue and red LED thing? Because that was becoming like a trendy thing where people thought because your photosynthetic peaks are in your red and your blue primarily, that's, that's all we needed. So I sat there and I have an expression, when a wise man asks you a question, they already know the answer. They, they're more interested in your response. So my response was, let me guess, you didn't get any cell division in this, 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 and this. And their eyes opened up like cookies and they said, whoa, okay, maybe this guy does know what he's talking about. So my point is, is that I believe that in certain systems, not all systems, these planktonic organisms that you can't see or these phototropic microorganisms that you can't see can be some of your best friends in not only coral food, but just so many processes in uh, the tank or system itself. And I've often wondered, so for example, Rich, have you ever grown phytoplankton? Yeah. Okay, here's my question for you. If you needed to grow a culture of phytoplankton, would you illuminate it with just blue light? Absolutely not. You would have little or no cell division. Why? Because the corals, because of the way nature designed them, yes, they are utilizing more of that blue where your terrestrial organisms are, 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 you know, your plants and things, they are more reliant on the reds because red is lost at, 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 at like, what it's like a few meters and red yeah. is just absorbed and gone. But interestingly enough, and Rich, correct me if I'm wrong, on the surface of the ocean, there's almost like this layer of life yeah, and, and, and the planktons and things like that. And they're just absorbing all of this energy. And the other interesting thing that I discovered by working with oysters, for example, was that oysters are very rich in vitamin D. And we're like, well, where are these oysters getting the vitamin D from? Because they don't care about light. You know, they, they don't care. Well, it, obviously, it was the plankton because that's their primary diet. And here's the interesting thing. What we discovered was that these plankton were very rich in vitamin D, but it was in a very rigid form. And once you exposed it to the proper amount of light uh, in, in, let's say, the 290 nanometer region, which would fall into like your UVB, the cell actually changed and the vitamin D basically went from a like a pre-vitamin where it was not really usable or absorbable into something that these these organisms can now absorb. So light does a lot, light does a lot more with our water than just the corals, even photolysis. At the same time, I would say that that I think most people with home tanks are not going to get they're not really growing the plankton in, in any meaningful way, right? right. The, right. The, that, that layer at the top is getting uh, turned over way too many times and uh, no, there's too much filtration. No. And so, yeah. And, and that also brings up something, it sparks something in my head. There's other reasons to move away from metal halide besides the light quality. Right. You know, there's, there's heating issues. Um, well, maybe there's one reason, and that's it—just heating issues. Uh, you know, I know my my 
my instances of heat spikes in my tank, you know, pretty much went away after we moved because, you know, the heat lamps aren't heating the water in the same kind of way. Well, I'll tell you what, Rich, and, and Keith can attest to this. In fact, I had this conversation with Mike Paletta as well. The one of the things that I was able to do is I was really able to minimize that heat. Yeah. Meaning, like Keith, you have some of our fixtures. Oh, he the, can put these fixtures all day long and walk. Yeah, over you can put, put your you can put your hand on it without any fans. Yeah. And the other interesting thing is, it's a matter of work. People talk about how oh, this uses so much power or this uses so much power, right. but as you know, there's a work requirement. At corals, for example, no different than we have ca caloric requirements, corals have energy requirements that they need to meet. And, and Sanjay, for example, by the time he swapped out the LEDs, did he really save any power? No, he no. did not. Because the tank had a certain requirement, there was a certain amount of work that needed to be done, and it is what it is kind of thing. But I will agree, I will agree that the, the downside to halide is they do have to have a certain mass or size in order to operate efficiently. They do need a certain amount of airflow. I mean, it's no doubt that LEDs are way more convenient, way more compact, way more user-friendly, if you will. I'll concede that any day of the week, yeah. so, so, that they're way well, more user-friendly. So let's, let's, it's just a different tool. Let's, let's ask, uh, answer this question, though. Um, and, and both um, Alex Correa and... And Greg Carroll have made this comment, and I've, I've read this too. You know, so why, in, in terms of the halides, why are halide sales up at Hamilton? And um, I don't know, Tulio, are they up at uh, Reef Bright? Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. yeah, so I guess the question is, why are halide sales up if that seems to be because a dying people, technology? Honestly, it's just that people are rediscovering them again as an option. Well, halides. Yeah, will halides take over the, the the hobbyist aquarium industry or even public aquariums? Absolutely not. But they do have their place and they will be around for a while. We sell quite a few. Uh, for example, I do very special mercury vapor lamps for sea turtles and penguins. We did this awesome thing with the Newport Aquarium, for example, where we install these metal halide systems for their penguins. And Rich, you know how they do the uh, Petri dish? You know, you guys got to swab your exhibits and things yeah. like that for, for, for the uh, plate counts. What they noticed was in, in this, and, and of course it was an enclosed area with these halides, but we were pumping so much UVA and even UVB and the penguins were fine. But what they found was the plate counts actually went down because what people don't realize is when used properly, UV is mother nature's disinfectant. Mm. Yeah. But I think it's Ooh. just people are rediscovering halides and, and that they are still an option if you yeah. will. Every, every 10 years, the, the, the wheel moves around again. And, you know, what, what we forgot 10 years ago is now back as some brand new tech that people discover, which is, which is fun to watch. I want to bring back power I'm compact forward to, I'm looking forward to the, the modern nipple up or nipple down discussion that's coming soon enough. I don't know what that is. but The big you nipple wars. A what? The nipple wars of the LED. Inside the envelope, there's a nipple where it, how that gas uh, that gas envelope is sealed and okay. there's always been debate about what position that nipple should be in for I can the that best for you, life if you'd like let's hear it let's uh, uh, this is great because everyone's got an answer hopefully mine and tulio's are the same because then i'll feel good about myself okay one one it should be nipple up and here's why that's if it's nipple down, if it's nipple down, the, the mercury can actually pool in the nipple. And you want yeah. to avoid that. Secondly, if the nipple's down, you're going to get light distortion from the glass. Dude, that was just like double-ended halides. Remember that? Because I used them a lot. You had to have the nipple up and not the nipple pointing down. But then but but I agree, Tulio. That's that's the same reasoning that's always made sense to me. But but Hobbies being what hobbies are, you would get people that would die on the hill that nipple down was the correct orientation. Folk, they would, folks, they would folks are saying plant their flag. There. Folks are saying nipple but up in the comment, of, comments. Yeah. It, if it makes you feel better, Rich, you were right because in terms of physics, you want the nipple up. 
just because you don't want the you don't want the uh, mercury pooling in the nipple. And here's another interesting thing: what people don't realize, let's say even with fluorescent lamps, if you really want to like like cut hairs, if you will, and, and just like get crazy about it, even even T5 lamps, they, there can be some benefit, if you will, of rotating the lamps. Sure. Because it's the mercury that's excited and you don't want exactly, you don't want the mercury pooling on either side of the lamp and things like that. So, so nipple up. Yes. Nipple up. So, and also, you know, just the nipple blocks the light. Yeah. It, it's just, there's something else between what you want lit and where the arc is. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm aroused by this conversation, but Julia, <laughs> let me, let me, if I, if I could just change directions just really fast, because I, I glommed onto something you said earlier, and I have, a, I have an actual question for you. No, so you said the lights, well, you know, I've seen videos of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, red light and blue light. You're saying that's a sham? No, no, it's not a sham, but, but okay, it's misunderstood, and I'll tell you why. Um, okay, I'll tell you what, Keith, can you pull up the, Im the image for chlorophyll? Uh, yes. Uh, it's it's coming your way. Nipple. I like the comment. Chlorophylls. I like the comment by John E. Chug each time they say nipple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and thank, thanks, uh, Chris at ACA Aquaculture for that super chat. His comment is, Tulio is the man. Fist bump. Metal highlight for grow and LED for show. Chris, thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Remind me to give you that 20 bucks I owe you. <laughs> it's up there. But anyway, so we're looking at the chlorophyll. And as you can see, there's pretty, you know, obviously you have your peaks, right? Now, I call this the human condition. I call this the human condition, meaning we see the peak and we think, well, we have to put more there. That's like the peak. So we have to put more there. What that peak, what that absorption peak is saying is that corals or the chlorophyll itself, your chlorophyll A or B, is most efficient at absorbing light at that section. Now, let's substitute the word for efficient with sensitive. See, it gets back to like what Rich said, more is not always better because then you can get into photoregulation and other things like this. So more light is not necessarily the case, but there's pretty much response right across the board, even, even into the yellow and some of that. Now, Keith, if you do me a favor, pull up the other image for chlorophyll light absorption. Yeah. Because remember something, guys, we're not just talking about chlorophyll, we're talking about pigments. OK, and pigments are another thing. So, for example, in the wild, many corals will develop these ridiculous colors, purple included, to protect themselves from the intense UV light from the sun because they're actually out of the water for X period of time a day. And they're just getting beaten on with direct sunlight. So pigments can be used to absorb energy. Pigments can be used to reflect energy. There's a much bigger picture, again, even than just the chlorophyll alone. Man, I want people who accuse me of being too verbose. <laughs> I want to make sure that they reference this video because Tulio has the crown. But, buddy, I just want hey, I just I'm want the to just John Wayne Casey of verbose. <laughs> It, they're all under your floorboards and they whisper to you at night. But listen, I just want a yes or no. Like, so this popularity of the red and blue LEDs, you know, like a AI and Kessel to light. Let's just go. So I say Kytomorpha. Some people say Cheeto, whatever the hell. Kytomorpha, Ketomorpha, whatever. Keto. Would you light? Would you? Keto? Ketomorpha? So, Cheetos. Kato. Huh? Cheetos. Kato. Your mama. <laughs> your mama. Okay. The green pubic hairs. What, so yes. would you, would you, yes or you no, would not light them with red and blue lights? The problem is, Ben, it depends. Oh, my God, yes or no? <laughs> okay, no. And I'll tell you why. No, and I'll tell you no, why. No, just no. Just no. <laughs> no, that's all. Done. Okay, end of show. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Wait, it's not my all show. Right. <laughs> not all red is created equal. Red is a very big band. You have far red, you even have infrared, for example. Oh and even God. NASA, even NASA, by the way, 
They did this cool study where they used 750 nanometers and they showed response and things like that. So we can't just say red. It, it, it's what wavelength or what band of, of energy we're talking about. That's all. Because I can put a 625 nanometer LED on something, it's red to the human eye, but it's nowhere near as effective as, let's say, a photo red would be at 660 or 665. So Tulio, the lighting expert, is saying don't get wrapped around the axle about lighting your refugium with a red and blue light. Absolutely. Done. You can use a cheap CFL lamp and have great success. Okay. As a matter of fact, I'm, I was just about to get a refugium light for a client's deal. And now, based on Tulio's words, I'm not. I'm just going to go for a, a broad spectrum one. Exactly. You and can't go wrong. work. I'm going to be mad, man. <laughs> you, know gonna work. you know how I know it's going to work? Because before there were super special uh, algae growing lights for your refugiums, which really aren't refugiums. They're really just algae growth lights. You're yeah. not anyway, but we won't let's stay away from that. Um, before there were special super duper lights, we just used screw in compact fluorescence and grew yeah. the crap out of stuff. Man, it's fun. I watched the video, which shall go nameless, but it, it, and again, maybe I'm Rich is going to laugh at me because I've been accused always. Of I just saw a, I, I watched a very compelling video, damn it. <laughs> about about you? About nipples. About nipples and about telling me to cut my hair and move into the mountains. Back to Barstow. <laughs> <laughs> what about this what about this video? Oh, that what, compelled it, you to buy a red no, light? No, no, I it didn't compel me to buy some. It just was very compelling. Even I fall for it too. It's just very compelling about chlorophyll A and B and the Red and blue lights, growing chitomorpha, blah blah blah, and I really, you know, I I got to get the hook out of my mouth because I really. Was, the, was there any support in the video, or did they just say it like it was a thing? I mean, I mean, th there was, and it was compelling, and it was a video put out by a company with uh, uh, three initials. So there's a. Uh... Um, Chris has got a question from ACI Aquaculture. Why an algae scrubber with red and blue light do better versus basic white light for nutrient export? Any thoughts on that? I I can't see why. But Tulio knows more about all the different red lights that exist. Well, it, 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 again, it depends. And the other thing is, is it depends on the algae and the scrubber. It does, you know, again, not all algaes are the same. If you notice, even if you look at trees and things around you, there's so many different shades of green. And that will affect the amount of light that the leaves can absorb, the wavelengths of light that they're absorbing, what light is being reflected. You know, it's not this absolute. And I did, by the way, it was it was some 20 years ago, but there was a gentleman, and I wish I knew his name. He was a professor at the University of California. And there's a lot of people that believe that there is importance in green light. And even Noah discovered when they tried to grow the plankton that without green light and just red and blue LEDs, yes, they were successful at, at culturing certain species of, of planktons, but many other planktons didn't respond nearly as well or at all. That's a really good point. It's the same as different corals have different light requirements. Different algaes have different light requirements. So the idea that you are going to get the right light that is tuned specifically for a, a fuge or an ATS or just a spot in your sump where you're growing GPH, green pubic hair, um, <laughs> is low. Is is low. That's why a, a more broader spectrum light gives you a better chance of growing what you put in there to grow rather than making the environment more specific for a type of algae that you may not want to grow. Does that make yeah, sense? We're, we're headed into a, a realm where you you could, you, hey, let me get one of those uh, ketomorpha lights or let me right. get a light or let me and, get a, a bryopsis light. And and eventually we'll get there where, where we can identify the organism to that level reliably, cheaply, and easily. We're not really there yet. And I think that may be one of the things that goes wrong with ATS um, is that, you know, perhaps in my system where I've tried ATS multiple times and had no useful success out of them, 
you know, maybe the wrong, maybe whatever color light that they gave me with it grew uh, better than the algae they wanted me to be growing. It grew something different. And maybe that wasn't as useful. To watch or more maybe, videos. Maybe. Maybe. So maybe, man. So what do you guys think? Should we uh, should we wrap this up? Any other uh, final thoughts on our talk, lighting? What, Ben? I can talk all night. You, yeah. Let's talk about ham sandwiches and <laughs> hamster raising. Feeding your tanks Go for bananas. It. Go for it. I mean, it's really up to the guys. If you want to take a couple more questions, we can do that. We can cut it. I know Rich, uh, I don't know what Rich is, uh, you know, both Ben and Rich were really nice to jump in at the last minute on this. So I don't want to, uh, you know, kind of yeah. uh, take all, over all their I've, time. All I really got to do tonight is is eat a bunch of Valium. So I'm <laughs> I'm good for some more questions if Keith wants to go a little yeah, longer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or I can just get straight to my Valium, whatever you guys want. <laughs> Wait, wait, do the volume and then stay on. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. That is a whole different live stream. Do not <laughs> after hours live stream. Do not try to take my real income away from me. Yes. <laughs> Let's see how old Rich is. How about a Quaalude? Yeah. Quaalude. Get some puppy uppers and doggy downers. <laughs> oh, no, that's a blast from the past. At the same time, so even. There, there was a question, uh, Tulio, that uh, was in the chat before about the uh, the degradation of the LED uh, lights over time. What, um, what can you tell us about that? I mean, what, what I guess the, the general thing I've heard is about four or five years you're going to need to replace your LEDs because of that. Um, you know, are there any things to look for in terms of the fixtures over time to kind of, you know, nip that in the bud? I mean, what are your thoughts? There's nothing. Well, well, here's the thing. This is one thing that you can use a PAR meter for, meaning that if yeah. you measure your PAR when you first install your lights and your PAR is 200, and now five years later you measure them and your PAR is 50, well, obviously it's time to replace the lights. And the fact is LEDs, absolute, anybody who says LEDs last forever is just full of it, okay? That's the song and dance that was sold to us uh 15 years ago. It was even. No, I know, but that's what all the manufacturers were, were saying is like, your LEDs are going to be good for 10 to 15 years, you know, and I don't know why I ever believed that. Maybe it's because I watch compelling videos, but. What did you, what did, what did you sell at the first iMac, Ben? <laughs> Richard, Richard, look, Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> good. He's taken care of, but, uh, uh no, um, yeah, I remember that was one of the that was one of the things, and it's like that's ridiculous because in ten and fifteen years, Richard has gone back to eating bars of soap. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in ten and fifteen years, I mean the same. I've watched that technology just go. Like, why in the hell would you have? That's what I find too. It it doesn't. It kind of doesn't matter what brand LED lights I buy. It seems about five years and just stuff's going south. But so what Tulio said about uh, using the PAR to kind of give yourself a benchmark for what the LEDs were like new, that reminds me of when I'm taking care of an RODI unit and you get that RO membrane in there, you maybe run it for a day and you get a baseline TDS reading of what it's giving you. Now keep track of that every once in a while because that'll kind of help tell you when that, when that is degraded to a level you're not comfortable with. All, all it takes is you writing something down in a notebook. You can go back and reference it. Oh, crap. Two years ago when I installed this, it was pushing out, you know, four TDS. Now it's at nine. Now is maybe a time, you know, when I should consider changing it. And when we talk about measuring PAR um, and, and, and and I, it's something else. If you think about it, when we measure PAR, often, obviously, the PAR meter is pointing straight up. Now, in many cases, my light source is here and I'm measuring PAR over here with my light shooting straight up. I'm awesome. not really getting an accurate picture of the light that's reaching my coral because if I tip the PAR meter towards the light source, now granted, it only may be that side of the coral that's getting that light intensity because the coral becomes what we call a stop and then you'll have the shade on the other end because you have the light coming in from this angle. But sometimes it's good to tip your PAR meter a bit Towards the towards the light itself, and you will absolutely get a different reading. You'll absolutely get a different. I have a question for Tulio, just about a technology thing. 
Do you remember about five years ago at Macna, a, a company was pushing plasma lights? Do you remember that? Yes. yes. I even talked to you about it at that one. I really like those. What happened? They died. Okay. Oh, I know something too. It was like but electrodeless too- plasma, right? Yeah, and basically what they were doing was they were using radio frequency to excite the phosphors in the lamp. Okay, the problem, the problem with that, the problem with that was basically most of the lighting, most of basically any technology, I don't care aquarium or otherwise, comes from other industries. Okay, and the point is, is that the plasma lamps for reef tank, there just was not enough demand to make a bulb specifically for reef tanks. They were just taking plasma lamps that they were using for industrial and commercial use. And people are like, hey, these are awesome, but we want more blue or we want a different Kelvin or we want this. And they really couldn't get it. They really couldn't get it there. They were using, they were using, oh, sorry, Ben, go ahead. Or I was just saying it was very low Kelvin. Well, they were picking, they were picking from the bin. They were binning the lights at different colors, and they went, this bin is kind of like uh, the spectrum that these reef people seem to be using. Oh. And there, there was a couple other problems with them. I mean, m- the main one, I think Tulio's right on, which is they got military contracts. And so now you're going to make lights for these guys, or you're going to go over this way. And yeah, um, <laughs> the other thing was they would have had to get the, you know, the emitter was bigger than a ballast, and had to be closer to the actual light itself than your regular ballast on a metal highlight is. So it was it was it wasn't very easy to get them. I mean, you, you needed to be able to mount the emitter up high, close. Um, so it made it difficult to have it over a smaller reef tank or even a regular reef tank because you don't have that infrastructure to mount everything. Well, I be- thought I thought they were really cool and had really great potential. And they were so single point source. You talk about glitter lines. Somebody, I saw somebody today was arguing about shimmer versus disco. And it's like, it's, it's not shimmer. It's a glitter line. Call it a glitter line, not a shimmer line. Um, but the, the, the plasmas, man, woo, did they have a really, really hot glitter line. Really, really point source. Tulio, what, I mean, I don't know if you could answer this, but what in the hell would be past LED? There isn't nothing at this time. Seriously, there isn't nothing at this time. And, and like, you know, people talk about OLEDs and people talk about this and people, they're just one, all variants of the core technology where, where, where you're, in, you're exciting essentially a substrate and emitting photons, okay? And, and really there's, there, there's no better, if you're just talking about generating light in general, the LED is an awesome light engine. But again, its application, depending on its optical design, its fixture design and so many other factors, but no, there really isn't nothing uh, even in the near immediate future to replace LEDs. The thing that scares me, and here's the problem with absolutes, What's happening, for example, T5 lamps, they're getting harder and harder to come by because obviously less people are using them and more people are using LEDs. Well, like light- they're getting artificially pushed out. Exactly. And once Just they're like, gone, like they're Halide got artificially pushed out in everyone's rampant. Ju- Man, see, Richard no, and I talk not- about that. Go. It's okay. not artificial, it's, it's just. The ebb and flow of the industry. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, what I find artificial as far as usability and functionality. Yeah, but that's all. Yeah. Not versus popularity. It's right, but they're they're not going to go away. The only reason they'll go away is for environmental reasons. The same the same reason fluorescents are getting well. T five is a fluorescent. It's the same thing, and so. Because a lot of our industry borrows from bigger industry, if the bigger industry isn't producing, oh. you know, the machines to make the envelope for, for fluorescent lighting anymore, uh, when they go away, it will become too expensive just to have one tooled up for this smaller yeah, industry. Let's face it, no one's going to sit there and make that stuff for the aquarium industry, no matter how cool we think we are. It's not the driver of the industry. Right. Well, we are. Maybe. Maybe. 
We are. In fact, it cost me, frankly, it cost me a lot of money to keep halides available. Yeah. Just because, just because I do know that there are certain applications where they are needed. And even our mercury vapor lamps, and quite frankly, and Rich is correct, it is aren't environmentally driven, but when it comes to the animals with public aquariums, animal health trumps a lot of that. And they say, okay, well, we know that these aren't really environmentally friendly, but we don't have anything better to replace them at this time. So we will allow their use for this and we will allow their use for that. So it's a, it's really kind of a, 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 a it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how long we can even keep producing them to make the metal halide and mercury vapor sources available to the public aquariums. Yeah, yeah they're just get more expensive. Oh, I had a question. LEDs will run forever, but their but their usability in our application will go away. You could have, you know, when when they were coming out and people were saying fifteen years, and most of us were going bullshit. Fifteen years, you've never tested them. You haven't run them for fifteen years. You yeah. have no way you can say that. Yeah. Um, but five years seem to feel like it could be right, and it seems like we're. Four to five years seem to be before the drop-off goes away too much, but they will still light up, which is one of the, as as LEDs age, um, it's one of the things I think people should probably be aware of, and like Tulia was saying, is a really good use for a PAR meter. If you're not paying attention, you could get yourself into a little bit of a problem where your light stops being useful to your animals. And Rich... The same thing with like VHO boobs. It was still come on. And so people that didn't know are like, why are you, you know, non hobbyists, why are you changing those and throwing them away? They still came on. And it's like, no, yeah. the usable light coming out of them, though you can't see your eye is a terrible instrument to uh, to check like quality of light for a coral. That's right. Poke your eyes out. <laughs> and, and you know what, Rich? Uh, it's interesting because. What, what, what we call lumen maintenance or usable life and things like that. So, for example, in commercial and industrial applications, we have certifications called LM70 and LM80. And basically, that's kind of like the period of time that the LED is still at 80 percent of its you, you, you know, output and things like that. Yeah. And the reason why it becomes important, think about this. If I'm replacing, if I'm replacing, let's say, another light source with an LED, for example, something like a library or a gymnasium, they have minimum lighting targets for safety reasons. And basically, so when this LED is at 70 or 80 percent of its of its, you, you know, of its output, it's technically no longer usable. Yeah. And what I've often said to people is with, with, with reef aquaria, because photosynthesis is so critical for the corals and the animals that we're using, even if you don't think your LED fixture needs replacement, don't run it for 10 years. You should service it after five or so years because, listen, even our lights, and I tell customers this all the time, they're going to degrade. They're going to degrade. Anybody who tells you any different is full of it, basically. Yeah. I kind of like the idea of the LEDs because I know I can buy a fixture and then not care at all what's going on with the rest of the industry for the next three to five years. I can, you know, and then and then when it's time for a new fixture, I kind of like go, mm, <laughs> what's, what's better now? Um, and usually yeah. it's not much, but. It's kind of fun that way. Battle OCR, thank you so much for that very generous super chat. It says, keep it going. Rich and Ben are awesome. Battle OCR is a big fan of hers, of ours. I see him on our YouTube comments all he's the a, time. He's Thanks. a reef beaver. She, he. Yeah, I think I think they wrote frog on the last, uh, one of the last comments. Frog. <laughs> Battle OCR. So we got a couple of, thank a couple of more questions here. Um, and this, um, from Drew Young, would you, and probably for Tulio, would you ever expect to see LEDs sold as driver drivers reflectors and pucks instead of pre-assembled units? Uh, they 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 actually did did rapid LED and a few other people used to sell that stuff. 
The problem is, and listen, I am all for DIY stuff. If you want to DIY your own fixture, that's fine. But just understand that reef aquariums are a harsh environment. And what happens is people take the drivers, they take the pucks, they take the wiring, and it works awesome for a little while. But once that salt creep gets up in there and the moisture and the splash and everything else like that, unless you have the housing to protect the entire system, you will see... Uh, destruction. You know, that's Julie, the downside. Julie, about um, about six or seven years ago, I had a buddy of mine, because remember how oh, oh, more so than any other lighting technology for the aquarium industry, man, when LED came out, it was so huge DIY. As a matter of fact, in the very beginning, it was almost like almost entirely DIY. Yeah. Uh, but I had a, um, a buddy who messed with that on the side. He was an engineer. And so he made some lights for a client of mine, massive um, aluminum heat sink with the diodes put right on there and everything was raw, but it was in a cabinetry bright as hell. I don't know the numbers on it, but we ran it on there. And really after three or four years, no, you know, no optics, no anything, but after three or four years, man, it fried and it, it wasn't that close to the water. But, you know, and it, it, it's no knock on this guy. But, you know, we charged the clients like $1,500. And in, in three years, it had fried itself from just the, not even just salt splashing, but just the, like, the random salty humidity. The other, the other important aspect, and again, I'm all for DIY. But the other important aspect is the quality of drivers used, the quality of pucks used, basically the quality of components. Because what happens is if you're using quality components, what you're going to find is you're not going to save as much money as you think by the time you add up all the incidental stuff. This part, that part, the housing, the extrusion, the this, the that, the other thing. Um, so, so I'm all for DIY stuff. But interestingly enough, Ben, like you said, that kind of went the wayside because a lot of people came to realize that, hey, when I make my own stuff, not only doesn't it last as long, but the problem with that as well is if you're making your own system and you blow one of them drivers or you blow one of them pucks, you eat it. There's no return on electrical parts. To yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So DIY is awesome, but just keep in mind that that these tanks are harsh environments and mother nature, moisture, salt spray, it'll it'll just slowly eat away over time. Here's another inch. You know, go ahead, Rich. Oh, let's go with somebody else's question. That's better than mine. No, go go <laughs> ahead and then I'll uh read the viewers uh, question. I was just I was gonna wax about you know being in the hobby for so long. You know, at some point, everything was DIY for me. You know, we built pumps, we built tanks, we built everything, we built heaters, you know, everything. And on every single level, controllers, on every single level, I was never happier than when I didn't have to build something anymore, when I could just buy it. And the whole reason I got into breeding anything was because I wanted somebody, uh, I got into breeding cephalopods because I wanted to figure out so somebody else would do it. So when I wanted a cephalopod, I could get one. I, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I love I love the DIY people who are into it for that. Uh, but I think Tulio makes a really good point. It is not, and it's often billed as a way to save money. Yeah. But it it kind of isn't. It's also a way to not. take up a lot of your time and to frustrate you as well. So, you know, DIY what? because you like to DIY, go for yeah. it. DIY for any other reason? Uh, I once tried to. Uh, it's, it's, go ahead, Ben. It's it's very fun and informative to um, it, like cooking to, you know, like oh man, I want to make pasta from scratch. Um, there was one yeah. time when I made borscht from scratch, and I will never do it again. <laughs> and it was fun and cool and interesting, but making the bone the, like the beef broth from scratch. I mean, the whole thing took me. 13 hours and my kids hated it and I was not time well spent but in doing DIY just like any endeavor the other part you're not factoring in is your uh, the you know your valuation of your own time yeah yeah I spent um years ago when I first got into the hobby I tried to uh DIY a uh, an abandoned water cooler and turn it into an aquarium chiller and I spent uh, a lot of time I spent no money on the abandoned water cooler but it turned out to be an epic fail so um you know, lesson learned, but I had a really neat 
retro uh, water cool sitting around the uh, the apartment, which was. Uh, <laughs> um, here, here's an interesting question from Zach Blair. Under LED, I found it very hard to color up some higher light acros without bleaching others that seem to do better in lower par. Under metal halide, everything is coloring up equally. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll feel that. It's not the LED. It's not the halide. It's the difference in the coherency of light. So when you think of LEDs, it's very coherent. It's very directional, whereas halides is often indirectional. So what happens is, like with LEDs, depending on the position of the LED, the type of optic and everything else, it gets back to that magnifying glass scenario where the zooanthelia, like, hell, we're out of here. These, these energy levels are just way too high for us, so we're just going to split. Whereas, whereas with, the, with, with halide, that energy is just much more incoherent. It's just much more incoherent. So it's a characteristic or a behavior of the emissions themselves and not the light sources. That's what halide gets right, is the <laughs> scattering of photons. And that's what LED needs to work on. That's what I think the idea with the diffuser panels and the wide panels are about. Yeah. Is to try to make that kind of yep. chaotic coherence, um, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons that Neptune called it the sky was because they're trying to imitate the sky, not the sun. Hmm. Probably not, Richard. That doesn't probably cool. not. Yeah, it's probably stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna eat some soap. <laughs> I'm gonna be no, so he's got a whole he's got, a, he's got a whole pack of soap there. Yeah. I'm gonna be so sick. <laughs> But you and I had had, uh, had a long phone conversation about that once, though, which is, you know, that that is what halides get right. It's just a massive amount of light and then scatter the hell out of everything. Yeah. And that, you know, that's that's a kind of technological drawback with LED. But I do notice like a couple of years ago, you know, everyone was like more powerful diodes, more powerful diodes. And they're like, crap, these are powerful. Spread them out, spread them out, spread them out, you know. What about spectrum? I mean, are are um, you know are you just getting better coverage in terms of the spectrum with uh, with halides versus LEDs? Can the LEDs replicate the spectrum in terms of covering it all that halides can? That's okay. So there's a company. I believe it's Kyocera. I believe the name of the company is Kyocera, and they are working on LED chips that more accurately uh, basically replicate sunlight. So in this case, that would put it in that kind of spectral behavior similar to, let's say, to like a, 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 a halide. And I think if we've really seen an improvement in, in, let's say, LEDs, for example, it's not only the efficiency or efficacy of the LEDs themselves and even their quality, but it's a better understanding of how to deliver and distribute the energy from the LEDs to, 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 to improve, you know, to improve the total lighting environment, if you will. But there are there are absolutely differences. In fact, a, a quick example, a quick example. Uh, hey, Rich, do you remember? Do you remember the biosphere? Yeah, oh, yeah. Still okay. going. Yeah, it is. So a few months ago, they actually they actually flew me out there. They paid it. They paid right. to have me come out there and do a, a, a lighting evaluation of the facility. First of all, they were astonished to discover that through the panels, which again was no surprise to me because I already knew, but through the panels, basically anything 400 nanometers and under was gone. Yeah. All they had was 400 nanometers and up. And what they wanted to do, what they wanted to do is they actually, Rich, by the way, they're doing a million dollar renovation on the oceanarium. Yep, and, and they want to study coral bleaching and some of these other things. And my thing with them was they said, well, hey, while you have this equipment here, can you measure some of our stuff? And when I showed them, and, and, and it was right on the screen for all the scientists to see, when they seen the difference in the, the characteristic, the spectral characteristic between, let's say, LED and the halides that they were using, even they were quite surprised at that to the point that they honestly said, listen, we're still going to use LEDs, but we want to buy X number of halides to focus in these areas because, Rich, you do a lot with coral restoration, right? Yeah. Okay. This is a big beef that I've had, and who better to take it up with than reef beef, the, right? 
trademark, buddy. <laughs> so, so Rich, this is directed right at you. We were talking about that. Top, we were talking about that reef flat, right? Yeah. I pull the coral off that reef flat because I want to culture it and bring it back to the ocean. The problem is many of these facilities are putting these corals under artificial lights. And you know, Rich, am I lying? Am I lying when I say that is now a different organism? It is. It, well, it, now you're in trouble when you want to put it back. Bingo. You know? and it's that, the same thing as it's the same thing as, you know, earlier when Keith asked, you know, what's the one light? The, if I was actually growing corals for sale, the one light I would use would be the best selling light if there was a clear winner in the market, because the corals are going to do better if they go under the same kind of light. Once you move them out off the reef onto artificial light, you're going to have a problem acclimating them back. You get acclimation problems both direction. I think uh, that if Biosphere is doing that, I'm really happy. Um, you know, some some halides in there to fill it out, I think is great. Now, if they would do some focusing on flow in their reef tank, I'd be really happy with them. But you know what sounds silly is growing corals under lights driven by fossil fuels to put back on the reef that has been destroyed because of fossil fuels. That does sound silly. And hey, hey Ben, is that kind of like paper bags? Do you remember what was it back in the 80s when we, we, we said you can't use pa uh, um, uh, paper bags anymore because it was evil? And so plastic was going to be this great new thing that we were using plastic bags and things like that. And hence, we see some of the problems these days with the plastics. It's almost like you can't necessarily trust the manufacturer. Yeah. <laughs> if I could give a piece of advice to the biosphere is really they're going to go a long way in improving their facility there if they don't let Polly Shore live inside of it. Yeah. <laughs> So, so maybe on that note, we're gonna uh, we're gonna wrap up the uh, the live stream tonight. <laughs> Good, because my butt hurts. Yeah, and I, hey, and I got I got to pee too. So you know. Stream. Yeah, I got to pee too. But Keith, can I just close with one thing? Tulio, you got you Please. got the final word. Okay, no, it's not even the final word. I'll let Richard Ben get that. <laughs> I'm just saying is that I don't want people to think that we're bashing blue light. Well, I'm not bashing blue light or the blue light tanks. I'm just trying to get hobbyists to understand that it's different. You can't, you like like Rich and I were saying, you can't use information from the wild from that from that reef flat and then apply that because you're using artificial light, and in this case, blue light. So it is different. And and depending on your goals, whether it's coloration, growth, and things like that. So it just avoid absolutes. Avoid yeah. absolutes. And I'll dovetail with that, and then Ben can have the second last word, and then Keith can have the real last word because it's his show. That there's no recipe, and and we're back to the numbers thing that we started with. The the numbers are very sexy because you think if you match those numbers you win, but you don't. Everything is just a piece of information that you put into the stew of the thing that you're doing. And if you don't understand the ingredients you're putting into the stew of your reef tank, you're going to run into something that's going to taste too salty. So you got to understand what the numbers mean and how they apply to the your aquarium uh, with everything else that's going on instead of just following a recipe. There aren't any recipes. There's At this point, there's just a general understanding. My last word is thanks, Keith, for having us on. Guys, this was uh, this was awesome. My, I'm going to have a couple of last words. My uh, my my last words in terms of the uh, lighting discussion. I'm going to throw this in into the um, the equation. You know, my advice would be, you know, I I am a tried and true metal halide guy. I'll admit that. And LEDs, it's a it's a new thing for me. But I think what I've um, I've learned in terms of the LEDs and and this this. Um, you know, is true for, for whatever light you're using, stick with one lighting source. Don't keep switching it up. You know, don't try to like chase something. If this one guy is using LEDs and you're using T5s, don't switch just because that guy has a great looking tank. There's just so many different variables in play. So I think my piece of advice in terms of the whole lighting discussion is just don't make a lot of changes. Try to stick with something and, um, you know, see through it. I think the one thing that I've been learning about LEDs is that they're so customizable in terms of that spectrum 
that uh, you can really kind of get into trouble if you start playing around with that spectrum and even the intensity. So that's something for me, it's been very difficult with the, uh, with the new LEDs in terms of trying not to make any changes. You know, hey, I don't like the look. Maybe it's a little too blue. But you know what? You kind of get used to it. And, and um, you know, so that's just my, my last word in terms of the lighting stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, guys, it was uh, it was incredible to have you uh, all on. I'm not exactly sure how we all got together uh, today. I guess one of you guys had what was the beef with uh, with Tulio about? Uh... My my beef is that Tulio wears so much pastel colors. <laughs> <laughs> and that my my beef is generally with the angle of his camera. <laughs> and that that earned you an invitation to the show. And I'm glad uh, I'm glad you guys made it. So, uh, like I mentioned be, uh, before, check out the Reef Beef uh, podcast on YouTube, and I think what ReefBeefPodcast.com also on the web. That's it. Yep. Thank you very yeah, much. You guys are awesome. Very. Inter uh, Tulio, any plans for a podcast for yourself there? And where, where can people find you? No, I'm just going to hijack Rich and Ben's podcast and be like one of those hecklers, you know? <laughs> Nipple up. We'll have you on soon. We'll have both of y'all awesome. on soon. All right, guys. Well, listen, that'll do it for this show. I want to give my sincere thanks to you guys for being on the show. And I also want to thank the sponsor, Marine Depot, for uh, for supporting the show. And again, thanks to the viewers and the uh, the folks that contributed via the Super Chat. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. My, um, my next live stream will be next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's June 3rd. And I'm going to have Alex Correa on, who is... Um, an Aquarius, and he's, he's a, a loyal viewer to the show. He's got a lot of uh, opinions about lighting, so I'm sure we'll be talking some more about lighting and other stuff. So certainly uh, stay tuned for that upcoming show.